What if Joel Schumacher directed a third Batman film? Well, he almost did. The studio wanted me to do a fifth Batman, which would have been my third, which would have featured the Scarecrow. Not only was the script written, but the movie was being cast too, with Jack Nicholson even returning as the Joker. And despite Batman and Robin's campiness, this film would have returned to a much more serious tone, with Schumacher looking to tie up all of the films, including Tim Burton's, and bring the Batman saga full circle. So let's dive in and find out what went wrong and what could have been Batman Unchained. After Batman Returns disappointed at the box office and was deemed too dark by parents, some parents contend that Batman Returns, which is rated PG-13 is actually being marketed for younger children and the movie is just too violent. Joel Schumacher was brought in to take over from Tim Burton and lighten the tone of the series so that the film would appeal to a wider, more family-friendly audience and thus make more money. For a take, Joel would pick up his megaphone, his bullhorn, and go, remember everybody, it's a cartoon. And it worked, as Batman Forever outgrossed its predecessor and was devoid of any of the controversy that plagued Batman Returns. Warner Brothers, relieved that they had righted the ship, quickly greenlit a sequel and rushed it into production, hoping to milk this cash cow for all it was worth. In Batman and Robin, there was a real desire at the studio to keep it more family friendly, more kid friendly and a word I had never heard before, more toyetic, which means that what you create makes toys that can sell. With the first Batman film, Warner Brothers realized the immense power of merchandising as they made more from t-shirts, toys, and merchandise than from the film's box office. Not only will the kids need movie tickets, they'll need extra money for Batman gear from t-shirts to underwear. Therefore, on the sequels, a greater emphasis was placed on writing stories that incorporated an abundance of gadgets, costumes, and vehicles that could be turned into toys, which is why in both of Schumacher's Batman films, he does a third act costume change. The first one I felt like I was making a movie. The second one, I felt like I was making a toy commercial. And in a way, he was, as the movies were basically acting as two-hour advertisements to sell merchandise. We involved the toy company. We let them look and be involved in how the Batmobile was going to look, how uh, Batman's gadgets were going to be. Before Batman and Robin was even finished, the studio was looking to make another one, impressed by the footage being shot. Schumacher, realizing with Batman and Robin that the franchise was starting to spin out of control, also worried that it was disappointing a lot of the older fans by making his Batman films too family friendly, and felt he owed the hardcore fans the Batman movie he would love to give them. As a result, for the fifth film, he had an idea that was not only darker and less campy, but would also wrap up the series. Schumacher envisioned a psychologically complex take on the character, something he wanted to explore on both Batman Forever and Batman and Robin before getting pushed back from the studio and ultimately settling for making the lighter films we got. Writer Akiva Goldsman, who worked on the previous two Batman films, turned down the chance to return, so Schumacher turned to Mark Protosevich, who had recently written a draft of I Am Legend. After he met with Schumacher, who pitched his vision for pushing the franchise in a more serious direction, Protosevich locked himself away to slave over the script. Titled Batman Unchained, although often incorrectly referred to by fans online as Batman Triumphant, the script dealt with Batman learning to conquer fear while confronting the demons of his past. So who would have been the villains? Well, we almost got a glimpse of one of them in Batman and Robin, as Schumacher envisioned a cameo appearance to set them up for Batman Unchained. And this villain would have been Scarecrow, to be played by Nicolas Cage, whose sometimes unhinged performances would seem to make him a perfect fit for a Batman villain. Schumacher even went so far as to meet with Cage on the face-off set to ask him to briefly appear in Batman and Robin, which obviously never happened. It's rumored that this part played by Coolio would have been that cameo. Joining Scarecrow as the film's secondary villain would have been Harley Quinn, whose character would have been changed significantly for the film. Instead of being the Joker's lover, she would have been his daughter, and it's something she would have discovered early in the film, as it would have been a secret kept from her throughout her life. And while she's depicted as a psychologist in the comics, this version of the character would have been reimagined as a toy maker. Protosevich says he wrote Harley as sadistic, in a mischievous, fun sense, while being good-hearted and conflicted. Harley's casting, however, was never firmed up like Nick Cage's Scarecrow, although Protosevich did meet singer-turned-actress Courtney Love, then coming off a Golden Globe nomination for her role in The People vs. Larry Flint. Also heavily rumored to be attached to the role, which would have fit Warner Brothers' pension for casting big names, was Madonna, although it's alleged she demanded too much money. Interestingly, each of the film's two villains would have been out for revenge, albeit against different sides of Bruce's dual identity. 
Kennedy. The brilliant and apparently satanic Professor Crane would have had a personal vendetta against Bruce Wayne, while Harley Quinn would have been out for revenge against Batman for killing her father. Eventually, upon realizing they have a common enemy who happens to be the same person, Harley and Scarecrow would have teamed up with the goal of driving Bruce insane to get him committed to Arkham Asylum. To do this, Scarecrow develops a fear toxin, which he uses on Batman, resulting in an ambitious, all-star cameo-filled sequence, which would have seen a hallucinating Batman face the demons of his past, where he is literally put on trial by the franchise's previous villains. Danny DeVito's Penguin, Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman, Tommy Lee Jones's Two-Face, and Jim Carrey's Riddler all would have shown up, culminating in a final confrontation with the clown prince of crime, Jack Nicholson's Joker. Fear and guilt would have been the primary themes in the film, with Batman having to finally face the consequences of his past actions, particularly regarding the death of Napier and its impact on his daughter, Harley Quinn, which he would feel enormous guilt over. Schumacher's goal was to tie up all of the films, including Tim Burton's, building up to this moment. However, I'm curious how this would have played out, considering all of the villains that would have appeared in this hallucination were antagonists of both Keaton and Kilmer, and never met or interacted with Clooney's Batman, who would have returned to play the Cape Crusader. I can't imagine George Clooney coming face to face with Nicholson's Joker would have had the effect Schumacher was looking for, which frankly only would have worked if Bruce was played by Keaton. And while I appreciate that Schumacher wanted to bridge and tie up all of the Batman films, it always felt like his Batman films were a soft reboot and didn't really take place in the same timeline or universe as Burton's films. Spoiler alert, but this was further reinforced with both Keaton and Clooney appearing separately in The Flash. Chris O'Donnell's Robin would have returned as well but Alicia Silverstone's Batgirl was not in the script, with her character being written out, having gone back to college. And while Batman and Robin's antagonistic relationship was explored in Batman and Robin, it would have reached a boiling point in Batman Unchained, as we would have seen the boy Wonder and their partnership at one point in the film before returning during the final battle to help his mentor. Bruce's fear of bats would have been explored as well, with them haunting him in his hallucinations. After defeating the bad guys and his demons, Bruce would have traveled to Bali, where Protosevich read in real life, Monks and enter a cave full of bats to show they have conquered fear. The film would have ended with Bruce entering the cave as bats swarm him, demonstrating that he had conquered his fears following his battle with Scarecrow. So what went wrong? Well, as Protosevich was finishing up his first draft, Batman and Robin hit theaters. Boy, was I shocked by the new Batman movie. It's so overproduced. Uh, I didn't like it either, Gene, although I guess I liked it a little more than you did. I would well, give it two stars. How many would you uh, give That's it? exactly what I'm giving, Roger. Okay, fine. Not only was it critically panned, but it failed to outgross any of its predecessors at the box office, with many wondering if it would have performed better had it not been rushed to theaters so soon after Batman Forever, a mistake they were on the verge of making again. To start one up as soon as we did was really soon, I thought. And I think that, you know, ultimately the movie suffered because I think, number one, I don't think people were ready for it. There's something about these things being away for a certain amount of time where people's interest kind of gets starts to percolate a little bit. Shortly after the film came out, Schumacher asked to see the script, which at the time was an unpolished 150-page first draft. After reading it, Schumacher's main comment was that Protosevich had written maybe the most expensive movie ever made. And with that, a fifth Batman film was placed in limbo as Warner Brothers debated how to proceed. Schumacher, however, was still eager to do one more and would claim that he came up with an idea that would be far less expensive while pleasing hardcore fans. Long ago, when this whole thing started, Batman Year One, the Frank Miller comic, was always my favorite. And I was always hoping that I would do that one. Schumacher was originally hired to rescue the franchise after Warner Brothers felt Tim Burton had fumbled the bag with Batman Returns. And while Schumacher achieved initial success with Batman Forever, ironically, he would end up leaving the franchise in a worse place than how he found it. Are the nipples still there? Of course, this is Joel Schumacher film. Everybody has nipples. As Batman and Robin is widely regarded as one of the worst superhero films ever made. However, its impact is undeniable as Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige would call it maybe the most important comic book film ever made and that it was so bad that it demanded a new way of doing things and paved the way for adaptations like Blade, X-Men, and Spider-Man that took themselves more seriously and showed greater respect for their source material. It's also interesting how some of these ideas in Protostovich's script ended up in Batman and begins several years later. Thanks for watching everybody and don't forget to like and subscribe to Bullets and Blockbusters for more great content.